Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, we are pleased again to uh, uh, welcome <laughs> Professor Julian House, uh, who will be speaking today uh, about um, translation and culture. As a continuation of the presentation or the talk, she uh, gave uh, last time or last week. So I'm very delighted to give her the floor without further ado to uh, give a 20 minute presentation. And then we are going to have a very short break, a couple of minutes perhaps, for me to get ready for uh, my talk. Uh, and then afterwards we are going to discuss both uh, talks. Uh, my talk will take longer time, perhaps 40 or 45 minutes, so I, uh, I'm really sorry for that from now, and then we are going to have a very good discussion together. So uh, without further ado, Professor House, you have the floor. And yes, I think I'm you I'm need I'm to, I'm share, sorry. to share. <laughs> what do I, I, I have? So go, go to uh, where, something where chat and then share screen. Uh, with uh, next to participant there is chat and next to chat to the right there is share screen it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> it will work oh, yes it works, yeah, now it it works, works. Now. good okay right i hope i i have the presentation mode on that that was always a, a problem last week if you remember but uh, can you see the screen everybody we can. the participants yes okay. we can see it well, anyway well, well. i'm very happy to be here again sharing some of my thoughts with you i i spoke to some of them, some of you may recognize me from last week, where I gave a, a presentation and I was talking a lot about uh, old thinking about intercultural communication and uh, by, by extension also about old thinking about culture and uh, very briefly also mentioned new conceptions uh, about culture. What I meant then, just to recapitulate about old thinking about culture, are uh, um, ideas of equating entire civilizations, like the Islamic civilization, as some people Huntington claimed, and uh, generally nations with cultures. And I said that we should definitely shy away uh, from doing this, right? Because it's, it, it's, it leads to prejudice, preconceptions about uh, how people are. Also, the idea of entire nations having something like uh, a, a, a particular way of thinking is, is uh, relatively ridiculous, we said, right? Now today, I just want to uh, continue a little bit the discussion we had. We had a very good discussion, very fruitful discussion last Sunday. And today I want to talk about uh, only about translation and culture. And I will end this presentation if we have the time and if Hamuda lets me, I don't know, a little bit about translator education because it's very, very important. When I talk about translation and translators, I also mean interpreting. I'm using translation as a, an umbrella term, capturing also uh, interpreters. The difference being, as we all know, in the mode, one is spoken, the other is written, and the time factor is very different between the two modalities. Now, translation and culture. Oh, it, it doesn't, yes, let me... Why is there, I, there's something, Vataron ansehen, I don't want that, right. Okay, there are two generally accepted concepts of culture. One we may call the humanistic concept, which refers to models of refinement, arts, literature, music, museums uh, displaying the artifacts of a different culture, right? Particularly uh, literature as well. The second one is mo much more comprehensive. Uh, we can call it the anthropological concept that relates to the way of life of a group, a particular group that shares certain customs, certain habits, certain etiquettes, etc. In any concept of culture, we find two recurrent features, namely the first one being the cognitive one guiding and monitoring human actions so there is a cognitive a cognitive part of culture the second one is the social one emphasizing traditional features shared by members of a group that is a very important i think 
there, there, there can be two um, analytic levels of culture. I wrote an article in in uh, the uh, European features of, of, of translation in 2004 already. What I there distinguished is a general human level of culture where we are all the same, that sets us off from maybe animals. We, we all share a certain biology, right? We have a brain, we have a body, etc. The general human being that unites us all, we are all humans. The second level, we are already different, is the societal and the group level, right? Now, we, if we go a little bit deeper, we find that any society consists of various subgroups, right? According to geographical region, social class, age, sex, professional activity, and topic. All these groupings are different. The, the, the lowest level is the personal individual level, the level of cultural consciousness in any individual, because any individual is different, has a particular family, a particular heritage, etc. Et so there, there is the, I think we should, we should keep this in mind that at all these levels, there are differences. The general human being, as I said, humans are different from animals, right? But the individual level is the most specific one where we can say that every individual has a certain culture, right? Now, the postmodernist, um, I have to, the, I, I, I keep the, my, my, my um, screen is messed up by people in the, in the waiting room. I see now three people are in the waiting room. Can, can you dis, uh, dis, uh, Yeah, I, we will dismiss them. Can you put this away? I mean, I don't want to see this. Why, yeah, why yeah. am I seeing this? Yeah, yeah. because anyway. you are a co-host. That's why. It, okay, that's why. Yeah, but I, anyway, that. it doesn't matter. Disappear, anyway, yeah. there is a, a, a postmodernist criticism of the entire concept of culture. They look at the idea of culture as an unacceptable abstraction claiming that there are no pure cultures, no hybrid, they're all, everything is hybrid. Um, okay, cultures are fluid and a culture is an idealized system and culture is often seen as ideology. In other words, some of these people uh, throw out the idea of a culture um, entirely. Now, I uh, am not with these people. I think a compromise is good. The one um, suggested by Dan Daniel Sperber, in translation we know him, relevance theory, right? He talked about culture and views it in terms of different types of socio-cognitive representations in the human mind. He, the first level of his representations are so-called mental representations that everybody has. Remember the level of the individual. Everybody has different representations of certain things in a society. Now, when you talk about what's in your brain, that's why we have language, of course, some of these representations become public representations because we utter sentences, we talk about them. And later, if certain public representations have been talked about a lot, they can turn into cultural representations. I find this cognitive theory a very good, um, uh, a, a very good way out of uh, throwing our culture out completely. Actually, the, the book in, in, in which uh, he, uh, he discussed his notion of culture, uh, appeared already in 1996. It's called Explaining Culture, and I can highly recommend it to you even now. What he also says is that there is no clear division between mental representations, public representations, and cultural representations. But what we can learn from this theory is that culture as a, is, is, as a concept may be uh, useful. Uh, uh, at all. Okay. Now there is a constant influence on individuals by public and cultural representations in a group. What we also see in this theory is the overriding importance of language for the transmission of these representations 
and as an instrument of a collective knowledge reservoir. A language of a community is the, a very, very important cultural instrument. Okay, we also use language to categorize cultural experiences that we may have. And of course, we all know this, the vo vo vocabulary of any language reflects the culture that is shared by its speakers, okay? We all know if you learn a foreign language, we have all learned it, at least English, because we're speaking and listening to English here, and the, the vocabulary of that particular language also uh, reflects its culture. That also holds, and we talked about this last Sunday, also hold, holds for English as a lingua franca used by many, many people, okay? Now, the opposite view of that the language reflects the culture is a view that, that has come to be known as linguistic relativity, right? You probably heard about it, uh, uh, Humboldt, um, um, Boas, uh, and other people talked about linguistic relativity, and of course, um, Worf talked about linguistic relativity. The idea is that the structure of language directly corresponds to the thought processes of its users. And language is thought to be situated in the, at the interface between objective reality and our conceptualization of it, right? Now, the, the consequences of a Worfian postulate that the language we speak determines our thinking, that, of course, this postulate, which has been uh, demolished for a long time, at least the, the, the strong version of the of the linguistic relativity postulate. For, for translation, this means the denial of its theoretical possibility. Because how can you translate when your thoughts are determined by the language you speak? However, linguistic relativity, as I write here, can always be counteracted through language itself and by the creativity of language users and the fle flexibility and by linking linguistic diversity, language in other words, to external differences in historical, social, and cultural backgrounds. Anyway, which means the more we know about another culture's background, history, etc., the more we can counteract uh, the, the, uh, the, the relatively ridiculous idea of, that, that, that we cannot translate or interpret. Okay? Now, most important in translation is to my mind, pragmatic meaning, yeah, which means the relation holding between an expression and the cultural situation in which it is used. That is the socio-cognitive micro and macro context. If sense and reference in any linguistic unique differ, their application, how we apply a bit of language in a particular knowable and describable cultural context that ensures translatability. Now, if we define um, uh, uh, translation as the application of a, ling a linguistic unit in two different uh, cultural contexts, then it becomes accessible and possible. Now, translation can be de de also defined, I mentioned this last um, week, as recontextualization between a text in one language and a text in another language. The text gets recontextualized. And it's essential for descriptive and explanatory adequacy is language as a cognitively directed, remember I talked about co culture also being cognitive and social, a text in its function, in communication, in situation, and in culture. That is again what I talked about last week, that is the beauty of context. Any meaning needs to be related to the context, to the cultural context, okay? Now, let me continue. What is the socio-cultural context that is so important for translation? Context comes from the Latin word texere, which means to weave. So context here means to weave or join together. Context refers to the weaving together of words and sentences 
and the connectedness or coherence between different parts of the discourse. And we can also say that an environment and the conditions surrounding a specified phenomenon or object, anything that surrounds the object in, 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 in this uh, thing is the text that needs to be translated. And the context is something that it is around it. It can be taken to determine the meaning of the object. That's why context is so very, very important. Context consists of text internal and text external factors. We can say that language shapes the context as much as context shapes language. Translation as an act of recontextualization across different cultures means we enact a discourse out of a written text. A specific kind of context relevant for translation needs to, to take into account that doesn't hold for interpreting, at least not for simultaneous interpreting, the separation in time and space of the writer and reader in written text. And the spoken text is, of course, a direct reflection of the discourse uh, enacted. Now, to overcome the separateness in space and time in written texts, a translator must must transcend the givenness of the text with its arrangement of linguistic elements by mentally activating the contextual connections. Sorry, I jumped a bit. Activating the connections and conditions. So the translator has the cognitive task of linking the text to the old and to the new cultural context, right? Now, how can we describe this? I devised, um, I didn't mention it in, in detail, a functional theory of translation as recontextualization across cultures. I played around with the notion of functional equivalence, cognitively performed reference to the context of situation, already uh, suggested by Malinowski in 1935. The function of a text has both an interpersonal and a cognitive functional component that reflects the nature of language and communication. My levels of analysis consist of language, register, and genre. Register consists, as many of you will know, the, uh, the, the, the nodes of field, tino, and mode, and also what we discussed last week, the importance of the cultural filter in a certain type of translation, right? Now, what is the cultural filter again? The cultural filter is, well, why does it jump like that? Is a means with which the translator compensates for cultural specificity of original text with which he or she adapts the text to the new reader's expectations. In sociolinguistic, this is also called audience design. Absolutely the same. So the cultural filter is the instrument for taking care of audience design, for the new audience in this, in this fact. Now, the presuppositions in the two language community are frequently linked to the interpersonal functional component. In my model, that some of you may know, this relates to the dimensions of Tino and mode. This is empirically often difficult to verify. What is needed for applying the cultural filter in translation is empirical cross-cultural contrastive research. Very important for any translator. Uh, okay. Now, what I want to, uh, in, in closing, want to briefly talk about what all of these thoughts about culture and translation mean for translator education. What we need to do to educate students to become good or excellent translators and interpreters is to strengthen not only their linguistic, but also their cultural competence. We need to educate translators and interpreters to become sophisticated linguistic cultural experts. And we need to professionalize translator education. We need to stress the importance of functional approaches to language uniting linguistic and cultural views. And we need to increase the awareness of recontextualization, as I defined it before, across cultural context. Translators and interpreters need to be 
professionals. It's very important to compare our profession to that, let's say, of more acknowledged or more reputed um, professions like the physician, the medical doctor, or the, the, uh, the lawyer. For this, we need an evidence-based approach, the systematic use of empirical data to help aid practitioners in their word and clarify common sense assumptions. Like for instance, this is a good translation, this is a bad translation, without saying exactly why. Professionalism consists in knowing explicitly what one is doing, being able to talk about it and explain it. Very important translation, very often we, do, uh, we don't do this. Translators, we need to be highly qualified uh, specialists, which means we have to talk about what we're doing. Like a doctor explains to the patient why he is to take the prescribed pill, which means we have to raise the profession from the status of mere practitioners who just do things to qualified um, specialists who can share what they are doing with others. So they can be discussed. That is very, very important and still needed. We need a, a combination of theory, description, and, and um, practice to enable translators to handle problem predicting, decision making, problem solving, and um, have a translator that, that, that is optimally aware of what he or she is doing. Okay? And we, we need to link expertise on knowledge, theory, with objective external uh, evidence. Okay? An evidence approach to translator education recognizes the limitations of intuition. I was just saying I, it feels better. This is ridiculous. We shouldn't accept that. The limitations of an exclusively experience-based approach and to the, the need to make theory relevant to practice. The need to access observable data and judge their relevance for the cases on him. In other words, to be able to deal with research, okay? The need to develop critical awareness and the need to develop new skills emerging from critical evaluations of the literature, okay? The ideal is a symbiosis of personal and professional identity. Professional identities in every one of us is closely related to education, training, experience, expertise. Personal identity has many different, highly individual roots and cannot be generalized. The convergence of the two in the human being, the translator or the interpreter, is one of the preconditions for both professional excellence and personal satisfaction. And that's the end of my little talk. Thank you very much for listening to me, okay? Now I stop. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much, Juliana. I can, can I, what do I do? I stop now, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you stop sharing, please? Yeah, excellent. I stop, yes. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor House. And uh, she insisted that I call her Juliana because she is a very close friend of mine. Uh, so, thank you very much, Juliana, for a fantastic talk on uh, translation and culture.